ಭವತು ಸಹ ನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿ ನಾವಧಿ ತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾ ವಿಷಾವೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಗುರುರ್ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಗುರುರ್ವಿಷ್ಣು ಗುರುರ್ದೇವೋ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರ ಗುರುರೇವ ಪರಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ವ್ಯಾಪಿಯ ಸರ್ವಂ ತ್ರೈಲೋಕ್ಯಂ ಸಚರಾಚರ ತತ್ಪದ ದರ್ಶಿ ಯೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರವೇ ನಮಃ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 when you are running a house you require a number of appliances to help you in your work isn't it when do you, when you buy these appliances say a washing machine a refrigerator when we buy them along with that is given a manual to us a manual is given which we study of how to make a good use of that appliance and get the maximum out of it even when you get a car which you can use to drive and get to your destination that car also you get a manual along with it now there are two type of people one it is sufficient that they learn how to drive the car use the washing machine yeah. get the washing done or drive the car and reach your destination but even for that you have to study at least something basic about the car is it not something basic about the washing machine at least you must know how it functions how you can use it but if on the way in the machine there is a problem you will have to call an expert mechanic who will come and fix it up now if a washing machine in the house is gone you know you can call someone but imagine you are driving from here to sydney and somewhere in the middle your car conks out yeah. and especially if you are traveling with your wife i told you have it checked up but no then you stand there and sometimes the fault may be very little small but if you do not understand the machinery if you don't understand what it is make, made up of where the faults can be how to correct it you can get stuck stranded and even burgled in that road same way also even for ordinary appliances what you need is a handbook to study to know to discover and then know the intelligent use of it how much more sophisticated than any machinery in this world is our mind and yet throughout our life we try to study so much about everything else but that with which we are experiencing the world that by which we can make our achievements possible that very equipment remains totally neglected this body how much we pamper from morning to evening 
brush the teeth, shampoo the hair, use deodorants, clothe it, warm, cold, air condition, heater, everything with the body. But that mind because of which everything is experienced even through the body is left neglected. Therefore, the scriptures point out to us first what is this mind, what gives its power and how we can bring it under our control and then use it intelligently for our achievements whether in the material world or in the spiritual world. He who has mastered his mind has mastered the world as we said yesterday. Therefore this mind, yesterday we spoke about what is the nature of the mind and briefly just summarizing it that mind is made up of thoughts, not just thoughts. It is a continuous flow of thoughts like the river. And the Rishis have compared the mind to a river. If we have to control and tame a river, first of all we'll have to change the quality of the river. Second, what we'll have to do is change the quantity of the water. And the third is we have to change the direction of the river. At this moment, our mind's energies are getting dissipated and it is sometimes very difficult even to set our goals and when we have set our goals also, to achieve our goals is also difficult, isn't it? Yet our Rishi says success is the birthright of each and every human being. And yet how many people in this world can even achieve what they want? Leave alone a state of greater happiness, a greater state of greater spiritual peace. But even in the world, how many people are actually successful? So this mastery of the mind can be done when we understand the mind. Yesterday we have explained what is, how does the mind function? How does the mind get its power? Action by action, thought by thought, we have made cut out certain channels, certain belief patterns, certain likes and dislikes. These likes and dislikes further create desire in our mind. And when these desires arise in our mind, the mind gets a mighty force and it is turbulent, it is as strong as the wind and at the same time, mind at this moment as we see, it is chanchal and chapalam. It is not steady. At the same time, even if it sticks to one thing, it is unsteady in between that also and jumps from thought to thought to thought. Such a mind which is so scattered, this we call it, this person's scattered brain. Yeah. This thing he forgets, that thing he forgets, this he does, that he doesn't do. When such a mind is there, it becomes absolutely useless. Scattered mind. But that same very mind, if it were to bring, to, bring together all its dissipating energies and were to channel at a point, it can create a mighty power by which you can achieve anything in this world. We see sunlight spread out everywhere. And especially today you begin to feel a little warmth also, isn't it? Yeah. But this sunlight which is spread everywhere cannot burn anything. But when you take a magnifying glass and all the energies of the sun converge at the point, that magnifying glass with that light can burn anything. As children, have you experimented? Nowadays children sit only in the computers, is it? You take a magnifying glass and, and the worst thing they used to do in school was they used to take the magnifying glass, take the sun and if you are standing there they put it on your hand and suddenly oh, my hands are burning. Have you played that fun? Uh, they have. 
children around the world are the same. That's the best part, you see. No differences. It burns when you converge. Same way, our energies today are dissipated in so many different, different channels that no one thing we can achieve properly. Therefore, one thing that is necessary is to make the mind concentrated. To bring it to focus. For that it is essential. We've got plenty of desires. But some are essential desires, some are non-essential desires. That which is your essential desires, with that you build your goals in life. Once you have a goal in life, once you have a direction to move, you set your destination. Once you have a goal in life, at least you have a direction. Then, if you get inspired by that goal, and you try to bring all your mental energies to direct towards it, and once you love your goal, your mind will be on that, you bring all that, and put your energies towards that goal, then with such a concentrated mind, you can achieve your goals in life. At this moment, you want to do 101 things. Most of it, if I ask the people, why? Because others are doing. What to do? Mind is a monkey anyway. Yeah. Monkey loves aping others. To copy others. But sit back, number one thing, if you have to control your mind. First thing, ask yourself, what is it that you want in your life? What you want in your life, that is first what you should determine. At this moment, it will appear that you got 101 things that you want, isn't it? Think about it. People behind can't see me. Okay. 101 things you want in life, but when you really think and analyze, you find out what is it that you truly want with your life. Other things also, let them be there, doesn't matter. But let us first work at things which are essential in life. Others think can be standby, don't worry, don't, you know, because giving up we are very afraid of. Nothing we want to give up. Even sorrow we are so attached to, we don't want to give up. But, so keep them aside, but keep your mind focused towards certain goals in life. This will automatically give your mind a certain direction. It will give it a certain focal point. And then, very important is, you start working towards it. And don't allow, in the beginning stages, don't allow your mind to go here and there. There are some who can achieve it. They've got the willpower. Therefore, develop the willpower which is essential. This willpower is developed not by unnecessarily torturing yourself. This willpower is developed that whenever you make a decision, whatever, doesn't mean right or wrong, once you make a decision, even if you have to suffer, you do it. This is how to develop your willpower. In religion and all through fasting and all that they practice. It's helpful, no doubt. These are gross methods which we will come to towards the ending. Because there are many methods to control this mind. But developing the willpower is that when you make a decision, see that you fulfill it. That is very important in life. Fulfill whatever decision you make, you fulfill it. That is developing your willpower. Like you decide that I'm going to get up in the morning at 4 o'clock. 4 o'clock is too early, never mind. Yeah, You decide that you'll get up at 7.30 in the morning. Fine. But see that you get up at 7.30 in the morning every day. Create a certain discipline for the mind. When the mind is put under discipline, your willpower grows. A person with willpower can easily bring his mind under control. However, for everyone it is not easy if they don't exercise their willpower. So we want to know other techniques and methods by which we can 
help ourselves. So three things we pointed out. The mind, the quantity has to be reduced. That is through concentration, setting up our goals, the quantity of thoughts that channel take are removed. Then when our goals are noble and we maintain good thoughts in our mind, we get the purity of mind. Clear? And our goals will give us the direction. So noble, if your goal and ideal of inspiration is noble, you will be able to achieve to some extent all these three. Have you seen also in school, your children are going to school, there will be one child of yours from your own genes, very successful in school, studying very well, and the other one just cannot concentrate. Is it not? Everybody experiences that, isn't it? And it is very clear, you watch. One will have an ambition or a goal that I want to become a doctor, I want to become an engineer, I want to become a computer scientist, whatever. And the other will have no goal. Very often you will see that. Therefore, anchor your mind to some goal. Because otherwise with every wind of desire, like a boat without an anchor, it can be washed anywhere. So keep a goal in mind and gear your mind towards it. A lot around the world is going on emphasis on goal and you know I am repeating it, I know that. Because it's very important to be clear about your goals in life. Once you have a goal, it becomes easy. Now, the scriptures have pointed out very clearly how this mind in the beginning stages, which is full of plenty of desires, and we have explained yesterday, that it is these desires that give power to the mind. And when there are plenty of desires from different directions, they as though pull the mind into various directions. Now, how is it that we can free our minds from these mighty forces of the already existing desires in us? At the same time, how to control this mind from the distractions that come from outside. Both of them. Mind gets distracted from its goal by the likes and dislikes, the many desires from within and also the stimuli that comes from outside. In the Bhagavad Gita it is beautifully pointed out to Arjuna that don't you try to go and sit down quietly trying to control your mind in meditation. Have you seen people doing meditation? It's a wonderful sight. Yeah. If you're sitting on the platform and watching them, they'll be sitting there. Especially if you watch our children doing it. And I once asked someone, what are you doing this? I'm catching my mind. <laughs> Before we can sit in meditation and make our mind single-pointed, we should be able to keep our mind where our hands are working. This in Gita is called as Karma Yoga. We have got plenty of likes and dislikes and it is these likes and dislikes that create so many desires in our mind and as many desires in the mind, that much the mind will be agitated and multi-pointed. From such a mind, nothing can be created. We cannot give up all desires, but find out what are your basic desires and set your goals accordingly. Therefore, ask yourself what is important in your life. That becomes your duty. Is your wife important in your life? Don't say loudly. <laughs> is your husband important in life? If it is, then you have a certain duty towards them. Today, in this world, we only work according to our likes and dislikes, but not according to our duties. If we can keep our mind 
on our duties, whether our office duties, whether our family duties, community duties, social duties, duty towards humanity. We have a number of duties. But if we keep our mind to our duties, two things happen. One is those things which are important to us, that only constitute our duties, isn't it? Marriage was important to you, today you have duties of a family. Children are important to you, you have duties of a parent, is it not? But the problem is that we know what is important to us, but then distractions always are more interesting, isn't it? Because they give immediate pleasures. So keep your mind to your duty that whatever work you are doing, in whichever field you are, learn to do your best. Very often somebody says, you know, nowadays nothing that I do I enjoy. Office is boring. House life, you know, cooking, Swamiji. What do you enjoy? Only sitting and watching, watching TV. But that also nowadays there are all boring programs. Today this word boring, everybody is bored of everything. I remember when we were kids, there was nothing boring in our life. Today even kids, they go to any school, they go to any class, the only one word is boring. <laughs> Everything is boring for them. Really speaking, nothing will be interesting until and unless you find some interest in it. Is this clear? Therefore, the wisdom is that if you are in a situation which you naturally don't enjoy, you find some way of enjoying it. I remember when we were brahmacharis, sometimes you know, speakers, you know, they love to come and teach. Yeah. So especially to brahmacharis. And there were sometimes these really boring, absolutely, I mean, they were boring. Yeah. <laughs> they would come and try to speak to us thinking that they are inspiring us and they would come. And our teacher said, whatever happens, you have to sit in the class. We used to go up to our teacher and say, Guru, Guruji, please, you, you know what that person is. It's so boring. Please, Guruji. He said, keep quiet and go and sit. He used to make us go through it. Till finally I said, since I have to go through it, why not I find something interesting in it? You know what I used to do? I used to sit and listen to them with such interest, watch them with such interest, and I would try to learn from them. They had nothing to teach. Yeah. I would try to learn from them what mistakes I should not do while speaking. And I found it very interesting finding out what, what things that they were doing to bore us. Yeah. And all the brahmacharis used to get up and say, oh my God, this is frustrating. And I said, it was a very nice talk. <laughs> And they could see it on my face. They said, yeah, we are watching you. How can you be listening to it? I said, listen, since I have to suffer through it, why should I suffer through it? Let me enjoy it, isn't it? Hmm? And I tried to find out what are the mistakes a person should not do while speaking. You can learn from every experience, is it not? If you have to do a piece of work, if you start doing it to the best of your capacity, even the worst job, you will begin to enjoy it. See, I'm giving you something very practical. People want, you know, methods of mind control, give this mantra, that mantra. All that will be, I will mention to you. But then you will not be able to practice. These are simple things that you can practice moment to moment. Whatever work you have at hand, finish it and do your best in it. And you'll be surprised that when you are doing a best in the work, even if the work you didn't like, but it is something which has to be done, like it's your duty, you will find that you begin to enjoy it. And experiment with it. Don't accept anything that I'm telling you. There are some things which you have to do every day, isn't it? I'm not telling you that, you know, sit in a corner and meditate. Swamiji, I have no time for that. You will have excuses for it. Here we are talking about something that you can do even while working. That whatever you do. Another thing is when you keep your mind to your duties, mind you, an idle mind is a devil's workshop. When the children are busy with their studies, they have no time to think who's having what party, which movie has come in, is it not? But when there is nothing to do, then you look into the papers, which movie has come, which parties are going on, is it not? 
all distraction comes when our mind is left idle keep your mind busy with some work or the other number 1 so perform your duties when you perform your duties according to the gita and you do it as a love offering towards your goal then your likes and dislikes start vanishing away and mind you to some extent all of you have already done it i'm not talking about some yogic state yeah. as parents how many likes and dislikes have you given up already in your duties towards your children i'm sure nobody like cleaning somebody's backside isn't it <laughs> and yet your children's nappies have you cleared or not is it because you liked it but now it is an ass mothers they said oh we love it nobody likes it but they do it when there is love therefore either do the work that you love or love the work that you have to do either way if you are lucky and you made your right decisions when you are young because when you are young we have no time for all this but if you are young and you made the right decisions to choose your duties in life your work patterns in life as per your love then you will find it is very easy to concentrate your mind because what you love you will think about always what you think about what you love you'll do your best in it what you do your best in it you will attain it however many a times we make the wrong choices in our life and later on we come to do things which we don't really like to do but in spite of that find some interest in it and do it to the best of your capacity now that i am in it let me make the best of it when you begin to do that you begin to master your mind thus the rishi says that those who keep their mind on their duties for them there is no confusion if you are clear about your duties you don't have to think what should i be doing isn't it it is all set for you but when your mind has free should i do this should i do that no let me do that let me do this let me do that is it not duty is something that you have to do you put your mind to that okay now once we have set our goals when we are doing our duties what binds the mind and creates in the mind a lot of other even when we have set our goal even when we are doing our duties what creates a lot of agitations in the mind is our attachments to the results this word attachment is very badly misunderstood people i misunderstand that we should not want the results then why will you do the action if you don't want the results whether spiritual don't you want to reach god don't you want to reach perfection in this world don't you want money and if you don't want anything why will you do anything tell me you wanted some knowledge of mastery of the mind that's why you came here isn't it or because you wanted to please someone whatever it is but there was some reason why you came here is why is it not so it is not that not wanting the thing is there that your desire gives you the intention to work your desires your goals gives you an inspiration your intention to work that's the motive behind it but your attachment if you give up will give you attention to your work because when your attachment is to the future your mind will constantly be agitated mind will be constantly disturbed and your attention will not be at your work and you will never get your goals the way you desired it hmm? so your desire gives you the intention the ambition to work it is your detachment that gives you attention at your work thus even when we have got goals we may have the desire for it but do not have the anxiety for it one is through understanding the laws of nature and having faith 
that if I have done my best, whatever will be the result, it will be a fair result. I may not know that my best is good enough or not. Clear? Therefore, mind is freed from likes and dislikes when we set our goals and perform our duties. Mind becomes single-pointed while doing your duties in the work if you have a set goal. But this mind again becomes agitated and disturbed if you have attachment for the goal. Attachment creates anxiety. In our talks on success without stress, I think some of you were there, we had given an example that how to control these anxieties and worries. The best way to control these anxieties and worries is laugh upon them. Because they are really stupid. Once I was in Manila and one young man used to come and attend my talks. For two, three years I had seen him and one session when I went there, I didn't see him, so I inquired about him. After three days he came and I told him, Hey, where have you been? This time I didn't see you. He said, Swamiji, some family problems. I said, Why, parents are not well or something? No, no, Swamiji, it's just the wife. So I said, uh, uh, You have a wife? How come I've never seen her? Why are you hiding your wife? I must see her tomorrow. Now what did I know what I was asking for? And why he was not bringing his wife? Next day, he brought his wife. She came there and I immediately, in a very friendly tone, told her, I said, hey, where have you been hiding all this time? I have been seeing him for three years. I have never seen you. Why have you not been coming? She looked at me and said, Swamiji, I don't want to come to the Gita talks. So I said, why? I made a mistake of asking. My husband comes to it. What, what, what has he achieved? So I said, what's wrong with your husband? You don't talk about him, Swamiji. Luckily, my time was on. And I said, listen, I have to start my talk on time. <laughs> okay, but talk was over. And I thought, I hope my people will just take me and grab me off. Because immediately she came up to me, Swamiji, I want to meet you privately. Now I had asked for her. I can't even evade it. I had asked for it. So naturally I said, okay. So I dragged the husband also inside. I said, let's go. We went inside. Both were in a very grumpy mood. I could look at both faces. Not one person at fault. Both were grumpy. So what happened was that uh, I said, now what's the problem? She said, Swamiji, make him understand. He attends all these classes and all that of mind control and all that. And all that time he fights with me. So he just very quietly says, it's because she keeps fighting with me. So I said, what are you two fighting about? She tells me, that Swamiji, I want my child to become an engineer. So I looked at him. I said, I want my son to be an engineer. He said, I want my son to be a doctor. And they started fighting there also. And both had their logic. Now forget the logic why she wanted an engineer and he wanted a doctor. Both had the explanation. Then they turned around me and said, Swamiji, you decide. Each one wants me to tell the, uh, their decision. Never get between a husband and wife. Hmm? So I just told them, I said, listen, some inspiration came suddenly. I turned my mind to my guru. I said, now you better give me a proper answer. If I take anyone's side, I'm in trouble. If I take her side, this is Swami, you know, all this woman's side only. Take his side. See, he comes to your talk room. You man. So the feminist in her would come out. Yeah. Now what do you do? Suddenly an inspiration came. I said, listen, you two are fighting. Why don't you ask your son what he wants in his life? Why don't you ask him? And they both said, Swamiji, what are you saying? How can we ask him? He's not yet born. <laughs> Tell me the future is not yet born and you are worried about it today. Yeah. You plan out your future but do your best today. Yeah. So each time you start worrying about something in the future, laugh over it. Why? You are worrying about the sun which is not yet born. See, 
So, this way, do your duties. It will help you to get beyond your likes and dislikes. Set your goals. It will give you single-pointedness in your day-to-day -day living. If your goals are noble, noble by meaning it benefits others, it is good for others as well as good for you, then also you will get a certain amount of purity of mind. The negativities of the mind will be gone. Clear? This, the Bhagavad Gita starts off by explaining this. This is called as Karma Yoga, that how you can make action which generally agitates you into a method. Yoga means control of mind. Chitta Vritti Nirodha Iti Yoga Patanjali has said. So yoga means which helps you to master the mind. And simple way of mastering the mind is set your goals in life, nobler the goals, purity of the mind. Higher the goal, greater the inspiration. And work towards it, but without anxiety or attachment. Thus your mind will be calm. The river of your mind will start becoming calm. Its excessiveness will start removing. It will have a direction to move in. And this even if you are materialistic, you are not spiritual, forget it. You can achieve even your material goals in life. And only he who has been successful in the world can be successful in the final mastery of the mind to attain the highest spiritual perfection. Not escapists. Escapists are one who don't have any control of their mind. No control over their emotions. They are called as escapists. They run away. Such escapists can never achieve anything in the world, material world or the spiritual world. Therefore, this mastery of mind is simple. In one line it is said, do your duties lovingly without any attachment. And I hope the word attachment is now clear, isn't it? Without any attachment. This itself helps. Once this has been achieved, then we must cultivate certain values in our mind. Today, whenever we hear values, though it is getting a lot of importance, when you say value, value means honesty. And honesty means, you know what, Swamiji? Nowadays, if you are honest, you can achieve nothing in life. So everybody says, honesty is the best policy as long as the other one is honest to me. Is it not? Don't say there is no value for these values. Today also, we value honesty like we did so many years ago. It's just that we want the other to be honest and we don't want to be honest. That's all. So, our Rishi said, cultivate the fundamentals of all values to keep your mind under control were summarized in three which found, form the foundation to keep your mind pure and mind steady. Number one was Brahmacharya, control of the senses. Number two, Ahimsa, non-violence at the mental level and Satyam or honesty at the intellectual level. Today, around the world you go, everybody is talking about value-based management, value-based education. Today I met a tax collector. He said, Swamiji, I would like you to come and speak to our tax department. We want to talk value-based taxing. How nice for you all, isn't it? Value-based taxing. So, everything is value-based. We are talking about values, values, values. But the fundamental of all values is possible if these three values are there. Brahmacharya at the physical level, Ahimsa at the mental level, Satyam at the intellect level. Translated in English, self-control at the physical level, non-violence at the mental level and honesty at the intellectual level. Now, 
amongst Indian brahmacharya is so badly misunderstood. Hmm? It only means celibacy. Which every householder says, Swamiji, what are you talking about? We are not sannyasis. Yeah? No. To live a life of moderation. When we are watching too much TV, it is breaking the laws of Brahmacharya. Yeah. And we know that it is harmful, isn't it? Excessiveness of anything is harmful. Moderation in everything can be helpful. So, Brahmacharya means not to indulge in that which will be harmful to us and not overindulgence in anything. Sleep is good or bad, you tell me. Good. But if you sleep 18 hours a day, like Kumbhakaran, good or bad, tell me. Bad. No. Swamiji, sleep is bad. So I am going to sleep only 2 hours at night. Next thing, after 3 days, you will have a mental breakdown. Too much sleep or too less sleep also will be harmful to you. Eating is good or bad? Good or bad? Overeating? And wrong eating? Thus brahmacharya means doing only that which is self-control means what? Not that you deny yourself everything. Do that which is good for you and that too also in moderation. Enjoy the world, but in moderation. This is called as Brahmacharya. So this is control of our senses. Because as I said, one is our own likes and dislikes and desires that push us outside. Other is temptations that come from outside. Those who are not able to control their senses, each of our senses is a violent force that tempts our mind. In many of the literatures of our saints and sages, they have pointed out through an example that don't take these senses very lightly. These are the windows through which the temptations enter the mind. We are not supposed to close it like the three monkeys. Then you will do nothing in life. There is no progress if your senses are closed. And why the senses were given to us? To close them? No. But intelligence was given along with the senses so that what we see, how much we see, what we hear and how much we hear is important. And a very beautiful example is given to us to make us understand that how powerful are the senses. Each of the animals that you know in this world, they have one of their sense organs powerful and they have weakness for the sense organ which they cannot control. And because of that they reach their death. The deer gets mad with the sound of the drums. And you know how they catch the deers in India? They have the mridang, the drum. They play the drum and hearing the sound of the drum, the deer desperately runs towards the sound of the deer because it has no control over its ears and lands itself up in a trap. A deer which is the fastest animal, nobody can either shoot or catch, gets trapped because of its weakness for the ears. Number two, sense organ, smell. The bee, which can make a hole even in wood, it is said, was for a bee. But when it gets enchanted with the smell of the lotus, it goes inside, it gets so intoxicated with the smell that at night when the, smell, the rose closes, I mean the, the lotus closes, same way, a man of steady wisdom, a man of self-mastery, knows when to let out his senses and experience the world and should also know when to withdraw. These are capacities that we should cultivate in our sense. Because if our senses are not under control, 
our mind will run haywire. Hmm? So number one. But these I'm telling the exact, I'm not giving you cheap methods of mind control. You may not like it. Because people don't want these type of, they want, you know, Swamiji, give us a magical mantra. Yeah? That, you know, when I put in my mind, my mind becomes quiet. You better take some drugs, it'll become quiet. <laughs> That's not an advice, okay? <laughs> you can take a mantra, but mantra also you can chant single-pointedly if your mind is quiet. Those are given at later stages to make your mind even quieter and quieter. We'll show that, how it is. Effective, very effective. But these are your day-to-day -day things. If they are not coupled with these things, you can be doing mantra in the mind, but every time you see that, you know. Have you seen young boys? I used to always wonder why the neck keeps on going. Any beautiful girl passing. I wonder how they didn't get spondylitis. <laughs> see, control over the senses is very important. Thus we have to train our children from childhood. Not to suppress their senses, but to control their senses, intelligently. See what has to be seen. See how much that has to be seen. That which is harmful, don't. That is in line with your goal, indulge. That which is not in line with your goal, learn to keep it away. This is called as sense control. Then, when the senses are controlled, no temptations come from outside. But what controls our mind? Mind which is basically emotional, if there is negative tendencies like hatred, jealousy, etc. in the mind, that mind can never be at peace. The best quality in which all other qualities get enveloped, and therefore in India, Non-violence was considered as the highest virtue. You may not be able to love everyone, but at least never have an attitude of hurting anyone. Moment you have that positive attitude of non-violence in the mind, your mind will always be quiet. Now non-violence doesn't mean that you don't beat someone. Sometimes, you know your children, when they are not behaving properly, the mother makes a lot of noise, takes her hand, gives one on the face, the child gets afraid of the noise, but the child is not hurt. Because she doesn't want to hurt the child, she just wants to discipline the child. Where you don't beat children, no? They can sue their parents. Not beat the children, no? It's not called child beating, is it? They should be able to. Our mothers never bet, but the hands were always like this. Eat! <laughs> we used to get frightened and start eating. <laughs> never did it fall on us. Hmm? But she always said that there is a way that it will fall on you, if you don't. Hmm? Where you don't discipline the children, what they'll turn out to be, you can see. Nowadays they can see. Yeah, because it happened because they were child beaters. It is not beating. It is not hitting. So, physically, you can never be non-violent. Even while you are walking, you are killing many creatures. It's a mental attitude of not hurting anyone. Either through your words, either through your actions. That doesn't mean if you are, your country is attacked by uh, warriors to invade your country and you sit back like King Ashoka and say, I am non-violent. That is not not violence. Ram Chandraji went to fight with Ravan. No, my wife is kidnapped. Never mind, let him have my wife. I am non-violent. <laughs> that is stupidity. Ram Chandraji went into the battlefield, had the most vicious fat ba battle with Ravan, most terrible battle. But even while he was fighting Ravan, Yet only the good will of Ravan in his heart. That when he sends his ambassadors there, all he says is, Kaj tihar, Kaj hamar tasu hit hoi. See, even when he's going to fight with him, he says, Go and tell him not to fight and give my wife back, and there will be no battle. 
but speak in such a way that his good also takes place and our work is also done. Righteousness is kept and his good takes place. Even the one who has kidnapped his wife. And even while he is fighting with him, he gives him as many chance to go and realize that I can kill you. And finally when he kills him also, Ravana's brother comes there feeling absolutely ashamed that somebody has to do his funeral rites. Should I do it because he has been enemy to my master? And Ramchandri says, I have no enmity with Ravan. Like he is your brother, he is my brother also. Can you imagine? This is called as non-violence. Sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. It is not physically, but mentally, no attitude of hatred or hurting anyone. This is called as non-violence. When this positive attitude of the mind is there, then mind will always be calm and peaceful, full of virtues. So through the senses nothing is entering inside or only that is entering which is helpful to you. In the mind there are no agitations of hatred etc. And in the intellect, there is honesty. Now what is this honesty? Honesty is not just speaking the truth. That is also honesty. What is there, I hold on to it. But honesty is living up to your intellect's convictions. That what you have decided in your intellect, you should be able to do it. This is called as Satyam. What you understand to be right, that you should bring it into practice. This is called, it is when honesty is there, there is an integration of your personality. That's when your mind becomes single pointed. The very interesting game we play with children in our Balvihar class. Hmm? Okay? Will one of the child volunteer to come up here? Stand here. Yeah. Turn around. Hmm? Now, I will tell you questions. I'll ask you certain questions. You give me honest answers immediately. Hmm? As fast as possible. Okay? Yeah. Hmm. What is your name? What's your mother's name? What's your father's name? How many brothers and sisters you have? Okay? Now, I will ask you certain questions and you, for every question you tell me a lie only. Okay? Hmm? You tell me a lie. Hmm? Okay. What is your name? <laughs> lie, lie. Okay. How many brothers and sisters you have? Hmm? Okay. Which school do you go to? How old are you? <laughs> now did you notice when you had to tell the truth, how immediately you told the truth? Yeah? How easy it was to tell the truth? How fast he could tell the truth? But when he had to think about a lie, hmm, how much time did he take? See how much energies you dissipate when you tell a lie and to tell the truth, how simple it is. Okay. Thank you. Hmm? Have you noticed? Simple thing. You can experiment it yourself. That how much of our energies go away when we do not live a life of honesty. He who lives a life of honesty, his mind does not have to worry about anything. Again, when you tell a lie, next thing you have to think is how to cook up another lie to cover that lie, is it not? Yeah. Then always there's a constant fear in the mind that I will be caught. Isn't it? It is better you tell the truth and get punished, otherwise you will be punishing every minute of your life till you are caught. I said, finally it is much better that you are caught. I do, everybody must have experienced this. All of you went to school, I'm sure, isn't it? Yeah. 
and there are days you did not do your homework i don't in my case so whenever i didn't do my homework that day only the teacher decided to check the homework <laughs> must have happened with you and very often children will immediately instead of admitting that they have not done their homework they will immediately say how oh, did you have done my homework oh i forgot my book hmm? <laughs> so you say where did you forget your book you did your homework yes where did you forget your book? in the house and our schools used to be nearby okay go to the house and bring it <laughs> now immediately hmm, you start thinking hmm? oh but nobody will be in the house why what's mummy doing she must be in the market no <laughs> then you have to collect her said no if i say in the market she said go after half an hour and bring it daddy is gone to office and mummy is sick in the hospital <laughs> and his teachers live in the same lane you see so ne- whole evening he makes sure that mummy doesn't come to the balcony because the teacher will see from her balcony that she is in the house and she is not sick see the moment you tell a lie how much of your mental energies go away Thus, live a life of honesty. Yes, if you've not done your homework and you tell them that I've not done my homework, you will get punished, no doubt. But you will be at peace. Just see how what we do when we are dishonest with each other, we destroy ourselves. And once you've decided to be honest, you will never do something because of which you will have to tell a lie. Is it not? I remember when I was youngster and when I decided, and there are times you want to do something, but you know, but if I come back, can I tell my mummy that I did something like this? And if I cannot do it, then I better not do it. Is it not? Rather than lying, I don't do it. See, once you've decided to be honest, honesty also means when I've set my goal, I'm full-heartedly going to be honest to my goal. In my relationships, I'm going to be honest. In my wants, I'm going to be honest. once you maintain these qualities the mind is calm and peaceful hmm? so number 1 set your goal do your duties but do it without attachment do it with love number 2 cultivate these values by culti- cultivating self control you won't allow disturbances from outside you will not be dependent on the world outside the world will not have strings with you you know how to cut them off when you want to when your mind is full of noble qualities like non violence all others follow with it compassion kindness forgiveness all go with non violence only yeah cultivate non violence try not to harm anyone as far as possible as a physically it may not be unknowingly you will harm so many things but mentally think of harming no one physically try your best speech wise don't open your mouth if it harms anyone yeah but mentally have an attitude of non hurting of anyone and intellectually be honest such a person will have a mastery over his mind hmm? however along with that many other not one but hundreds and thousands of techniques have been pointed out for mind control but these are the basis of it once this foundation is clear and you have lived your life in this manner then in meditation to control your mind and turn it towards your direction is very easy and mind you men of realization men of single pointedness once they have decided that something has to be done really speaking they don't even have to lift their hands it is done not that they don't work but by their mere will they can even create universes our gurudev was an example of this if he made any decision it would become a reality shortly even before we knew it committees used to think where the money is going to come out from who will be the workers the moment he decides it manifests here it seems that anything that you decide nothing happens isn't it in fact very often you'll hear people saying you know i want to go to the ashram for the camp but swami ji i better not tell it you know because if anything i tell and decide it never happens have you heard of this very often 
I'm telling you know this thing is going to you know I'm I'm looking forward that this business deal will work out. But touch wood. Yeah. Why? Because anything that I say becomes the opposite. This is called disintegration of the intellect. He who has made his mind single pointed, who has purified his mind through these values, such a person who has a direction. has got single pointedness and concentration and who has the purity of mind he can channelize his river to irrigate many many fields right okay then another thing which is very very helpful is try to keep some noble thought constantly repeating in your mind for worldly people a goal should be fine right but for people who are trying to further control their mind a mantra or a name of a divine keep constantly repeating this call as naam smaran take some name of the something divine something noble so at the same time mind will become pure thinking about it like that you can become single point saying whiskey 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 very single pointed and mind your mind will become very powerful Hitler's mind, conquer, 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 conquer. See how powerful it became. Single pointed, but not having the purity of mind, it became destructive for others and himself. Mere concentration of mind without purity of mind is dangerous. Imagine you are channelizing the river, and all its forces are going through a small channel, and along with that there are boulders, mud, pebbles, and dirt can you imagine what will happen on the way today round the world they are having so many courses on control of the mind they only emphasize on concentration of the mind and the end result is finally they cannot cope up because the most of their students go through mental problems then they call us up please speak to our graduates and handle them why do you all run such courses so then some of the instructors who are very genuine came up to me and said that you know we are doing all these courses of mind control and all that but now we are finding that you know those who actually practice it are going i said because you all are practicing control of the mind without values of the mind without purity of mind if there is concentration of mind it is a rakshasa it is a devil single pointed is it deep but with no good intentions thus good intention with concentration of mind helps you to develop your personality otherwise it is destructive the moment you say you know you give them good value but swami ji that is moral values moral values is religious but we are secular secular doesn't mean that you are non valued and that's why secularism has got no value nowadays yeah. value as well as concentration of mind therefore take a divine thought krishna krishna buddham sharanam gachami allahu akbar Jesus 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 some divine inspiration name of something that is great even nothing else love 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 but i won't say take love because nowadays love means only going to bed i'm opening openly telling because love means that only so what can i say but otherwise even thought like love forgiveness even these values if you keep repeating these words kindness karuna 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 remember the lord karuna sagaraya namaha karuna sagaraya namaha there's many mantras our rishis have given our gayatri mantra itself in india too we have hordes of mantra which scientifically are certain vibrations that can help to quieten your mind in its depth meaning it has the highest knowledge and in its simple devotional aspect it gives the purity of mind take a simple mantra like om namah shivaya 
Shiva means that which is auspicious, that which is pure. I surrender, Namaha. I offer myself to that which is blessedness, that which is purity, that which is beautiful. Is it not? How beautiful the mantra is? In simple words. For a devotee, it is the Lord. Oh Lord, I surrender to you. Therefore, there is nothing for me to worry when I am surrendered to you. Nothing. Same way also, Jesus Christ gave, Thy will be done, Thy will be done, Thy will be done. Take that as a mantra for those who have. Thy will be done, Thy will be done. You will be at peace. Jesus Christ himself kept repeating that even when he went before he went to the cross. When he knows that he is meeting that, Thy will be done, Thy will be done, Thy will be done. Buddham Sharanam Gachami. In wisdom I surrender myself. I take shelter in wisdom. Om Namah Shivaya. I surrender to that which is all auspicious. Thus constantly or nothing else. Ram, 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 Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, steal Krishna, steal Krishna, Hare Krishna means you know what? Steal, steal away my sorrows, steal away my imperfection. It means loot Krishna, loot Krishna, Krishna Krishna, loot, loot. You heard, no? Loot Rama, loot Rama, Rama Rama, loot, loot. Steal, O Krishna, steal, O Krishna, Krishna Krishna, steal, steal. Steal away my sorrows, steal away my imperfection. Yeah? See how beautiful these mantras are. Take some name of the Lord, some mantra, any name, any divine thought, Keep repeating it in your mind. This throughout the day when you do it casually, it is called as smaran. When you sit in one place and repeat it, it becomes japa, repetition. When this constantly you repeat this one thought in your conscious mind, eventually it goes into your subconscious mind and it becomes like a thermostat. Number one, when there is nothing to do or you are doing something mechanical like driving a car or something, it is at that time you can repeat this constant thought, which one thing will not allow your mind to go and worry about unnecessary things. Number two, it will keep the mind inspired. Number three, it will give concentration of mind. When you require to put your mind to a work, fine. Most of the work while cooking, while driving, is all mechanical work. Our mind is running everywhere else, isn't it? So keep your mind channeled by taking the name of the Lord or some divine thought, whatever you would like it. Keep on repeating constantly your mind. Once you begin to do that and when you intensify by sitting steady and trying to keep your mind steady on that sound, whether it's the Gayatri Mantra, whether it is Om Namah Shivaya, whether it is Sri Ram, Sri Ram, Thy will be done, Thy will be done. You keep it single pointedly, not allowing your mind to waver here and there. And through regular practice you can do it. When you keep it single pointedly, a point will come where your mind will automatically and effortlessly keep chanting the mantra. And you will find that whenever you are working in the world and things get too heated, either anxiety or anger, immediately this mantra will come as a cooling force and help you to control all the temptations are coming in, anger is coming, frustrations are coming in, depressions are coming in. This mantra will come to your protection. It will inspire you. And the Rishis give a beautiful example to finally point out to us that this mind is our greatest friend and it can be our greatest enemy. It can be a greatest helper and it can be a greatest destroyer. We started our discourses yesterday and we'll conclude with this one example. One man, he had to do his uh, daily chores plus he wanted to meditate etc. So he thought that, you know, I'll have to meditate and do my studies of the scriptures if, some, if I had a helper who would do whatever, at, uh, all capable and who could do anything at my command, then it would be so nice. I didn't have to worry about you know, the housework, the tea and the water and everything. That one would do. So he went up to his master 
and said, you give me some mantra by which I can invoke a genie. You know a genie? Aladdin's genie? Who will be at my beck and command and whatever I tell him, he will do. The master said, if you want something like this, there's always a payment that you have to raise. I'll give him anything. So he said, okay, ask him only what payment he wants. Anyway, he gave him some ritual, etc. And he did it with great interest. And finally the genie appeared who says, Master, I'm at your beck and command. Tell me everything, but there is only one condition. Keep me busy. The moment you don't give me any work, because you brought me out for working, if you don't give me any work, I will swallow you up. Ah, he said, how oh, such a nice person. Then he told him, okay, go bring me a cup of tea. Instantly he bought him the cup of tea. Instantly. Then he said, Master, what now? Oh, bring me biscuits. Brought him biscuits. Bring me cake. He brought him kisses. Now what, Master? Now wait. No, Master. Give me some work or I'm going to eat you up. Oh, okay. Go fill hot water for my bath. He immediately, by the time his tea is not over, he's built the water and he's come back. Now what? Okay, go cook the food. By the time he's having the bath, the food is ready. Then, Master, the food is ready. Oh my God. Okay, lay it on the table. Then he started eating. While he's eating, he said, Now what do I do? Now what do I do? Go clean the clothes. By the time he's not even finished eating the food, his clothes are washed. Now what do I do? Wash the vessels. Now the vessels are washed. Clean the house. Before he knows the house is clean. Now what to do? And the genie comes to the war room. He ran back to his teacher and told the teacher, teacher, this genie is going to eat me up. He said, now that you've invoked it, now you can't get rid of him. Keep giving it work. He said, but how can I give? I don't have that much work. What do I do? So he said, do one thing. Tell that genie to build a post. Big pillar. He said, then what? Then tell him to keep going up and down that pillar. Whenever you need him, bring him back. Yeah, You want a cup of tea? Come down, bring me a cup of tea. Now what? Go back on the pillar. <laughs> up and down, up and down, up and down. This was a brilliant idea by which he could get his work done and yet not be devoured by it. Our rishis have compared the mind to be like this genie. It can be of all help to us. We need it. Use it, but don't leave it free. Otherwise, we'll start devouring, isn't it? When you've got nothing to do, that's only when all your depression, dejections, worries, anxieties, temptations, what is it? it? When you need to do the work, bring your mind there, employ it in the work. When over, say, go up. Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Ram Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Ram, make it repeat itself. Hmm? This is one way you can easily control the mind. Clear? Then there are other in the Gita, fourth chapter. How many examples Krishna gives through keeping your food in moderation, what you eat is very important. You can see what effect food has on your mind. When you take alcohol, it affects on the mind or not? Hmm? Then why do you think that certain foods can't affect your mind? Our rishis have pointed out what is the best diet to help you in controlling the mind. Foods that will create physical bad health and agitations of the mind should not be eaten. Again, too much food or too less food is also harmful. So what you eat, how much you eat. Learn that science of eating. Nowadays everybody is dieting. Not eating properly. Then, there are certain methods how by breath or... These are all temporary methods. I have given you those methods which are the basis of it. Even through breath, because between the breath and the mind, there is a link. And that we will conclude with teaching you a simple technique of controlling your mind through your body and your breath. An exercise if you practice daily will help you in any situation in the life. Thus, many such yagyas or methods of mind control have been pointed out in the textbooks such as the Gita. In the fourth chapter of the Gita it is pointed out where different techniques are given for mind control. Some may be beneficial for some, some may be beneficial for others. But what we have given you about mastery of the mind, 
what we have given you is the fundamentals the basis which is so natural anything you found difficult tell me to practice duties is that something you have to do isn't it you love your husband so you perform your duties don't you what's so difficult yeah but now and then distraction comes control your senses keep your mind busy with some sound mantra om some or the other keep it busy these are all methods by which you control the mind hmm? then this mind through its actions in the world karma yoga you can give it hmm, reduce through karma yoga you reduce the quantity of your flow of water yeah karma yoga means through your actions performing your duties setting your goals you control the dissipating waters you channelize your water you control the quantity of water with your devotion and love you improve the quality of the water and with your knowledge study of the scripture and your knowledge through gyan yoga you give a direction to your mind turning it towards your self the truth this is how our rishis have pointed out this is how you master your mind all these techniques when are given the scriptures they are well tested paths follow it for those who want for the daily by the various techniques given now one thing that we teach even to our children which is very easy to perform expose your mind to some moments of silence during the day when i say sub- silence don't try to suppress your mind and quieten your mind no just remain with your self spend at least half an hour in your own company no reading no watching television not doing anything just sitting with yourself and we're going to try it right now sit straight close your eyes sit comfortably and relax yourself and see that for no reason whatsoever you move your body no movement not even movement of your neck or hands or even your toes and fingers Now watch that your body is absolutely steady. And keep watching your body like a beautiful statue, steady and unmoving. Now shift your attention to your breathing and watch your breathing the air going out and the air going in keep watching it feeling it fill up your lungs going out coming in
keep watching. Now watch the condition of your mind. If you can practice this daily for about 15 to 20 minutes, you will see that without any effort whatsoever, by merely keeping your body steady, watching your steady body and watching your natural breathing, instead of doing any exercises of breathing, you can to a great extent quieten your mind. Not that there won't be any thoughts, not that your mind will not drift away into thoughts, but you will be able to a great extent equipoise yourself, slow down the agitations of your mind, calm yourself with this simple exercise in steadiness. When the mind is unsteady, the body cannot be steady. At the same time, when the mind is steady, your body becomes motionless. We may not be able to directly control the mind, but if we can make our body steady, then relatively the mind also becomes steady. But mind always wants to do something has let the mind sit and watch your breathing and you will find soon your mind becomes very quiet. Also those who have some problem with their breathing, automatically their breathing improves. As the breathing improves, the body health also improves. Thus in the beginning stages it might be a struggle for those who have difficulties in breathing. But you will find that when you regularly practice it, body which is a fantastic mechanism will start healing itself. Thus good physical health, a quiet and calm mind and in this mind you begin repeating some divine thought. Thus you'll get the purity, single-pointedness of mind. Practice this daily in the morning and start your day with it. If you can do it also before you go to sleep, your sleep will also be wonderful. Follow the instruction. Master the mind and win the world. Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate 
पूर्णस्य पूर्णमाधाय पूर्णमेवशिष्य ओ शाति 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 हरि ओ श्री गुरभ्यो नम हरि ओम